and uh, be a part of this very special service. So blessed by your music today. Thank you. Wonderful. We can see the joy of the Lord in your lives. Thank you so much for sharing with us. One of the happy privileges that uh, I never anticipated in these latter years of my ministry was the opportunity to be involved with the Gaston Christian Center. Uh, I've known Gary a long time. Barbara, my wife, is here with me today. and We have known Gary and Linda Cook for a number of years through our dear friends, the Brewsters. And uh, as the more I begin to hear about what the Lord was doing here through the Gaston Christian Center, I was, I was enthralled by the uniqueness of this work and the openness of this congregation, all of these congregations who worship here. And uh, I was drawn to it like a fly to honey. <laughs> and I was just uh, anxious to get involved in any way I could. And so uh, the little country church where I'm the pastor, uh, was not, it is, is an independent Baptist church and it wasn't involved with any denominational entity whatsoever and so therefore it wasn't doing any mission work. And so I led them to participate, as Dr. Cook has said earlier, I led them to participate with their missions money in what's going on at Gaston because I've never known a greater manifestation of the missionary spirit and heart than that which we have seen here. And we feel like that we have a ministry to a large portion of the world that has come to Dallas, Texas. And uh, we're grateful for the privilege of doing that. I've been asked to share with you this morning <clears throat> a little bit of the background of uh, uh, Adoniram Judson. I've studied about him ever since I was in our age as a boy uh, in Baptist churches where I've been, where I grew up. But I didn't uh, realize the tremendous sacrifice that they made to bring the gospel to Burma. And so I have been intrigued over these last weeks in preparing for this service today to know some things about Adoniram Judson and his wife, Ann Hazeltine Judson, that I was not aware of before. So I uh, renewed a great appreciation for these founding missionaries uh, that are so much a part of our history. On February the 19th of 1812, having just been appointed as new missionary to the East by the Congregationalist General Association, Adam Aaron Judson and his wife Anne Hazeltine Judson set sail for India along with Luther Rice and Samuel and Harriet Newell. They arrived in Calcutta on June 17th of that year and while on board the ship, those long months traversing the waters, they did a detailed study of baptism because they knew they were going to be meeting with some Baptists when they arrived. Their study of baptism led them to the conviction that baptism by immersion in obedience to the command of the Lord Jesus was the biblical instruction for them. And as a result, in September of that same year, Judson and his wife were baptized by immersion in Calcutta and quite quickly resigned from the Congregationalist Association and joined the Baptist denomination. Now, unable to evangelize Hindus because of local and British opposition, they were expelled from India by the British East India Company, and in July of 1813, they moved on to Burma. Finding no fertile ground for evangelizing the Burmese, the Judsons immersed themselves in the Burmese language, and this was a key to their, uh, a main key to their ministry. Commonly, they studied 12 hours a day, and even at that, it took them three years to learn to speak the language. During this time, they were totally isolated from any contact with either American 
or Europeans. It was four years before they dared hold any kind of public meeting. Their attempts to interest the natives of Rangoon were met with almost total indifference. The concept of one living and powerful God was totally foreign to their culture. If that wasn't discouraging enough, their second child died at the age of eight months. Counting the first, which was miscarried, on the ship, they eventually lost three children in the course of their service. It took 12 years to make 18 converts, but eventually Judson found a way to adapt local customs to evangelism, and soon there was a Myanmar church, established schools, trained preachers. As a result, they finally wound up being a substantial congregation of about 500,000 people composed of Burman, Karen, and others amounting to that number. Now, during the first Burmese war with Britain in the mid-1820s, <coughs> Judson was imprisoned by Myanmar forces and subjected to extreme torture. His wife's heroism during this time while he was in prison, had become legendary. In 1834, he completed the task of translating the Bible into Burmese. And if that wasn't amazing enough, he also produced a dictionary. I share this thumbnail sketch of Judson's life this morning to demonstrate what a great price was paid to take the gospel to Burma. Judson's wife, Anne, died in Burma in 1826, the victim of long and dreadful months, 21 months of horrible disease. Judson himself died in April of 1850 at the age of 61, aboard a ship in the Bay of Bengal, and was buried at sea. He had spent 37 years of missionary service with only one trip back home to America. But while the nation was Burmese, a lost province of Great Britain, and the missionaries were American, the person most responsible for that first significant growth was neither Burmese, British, nor American, but rather he was a Korean by the name of Ko Fa Yu, who built on the foundational work of Adoniram Judson. He was no sooner baptized <laughs> than he struck out into the wilderness, into the jungle, to preach to his fellow tribe members. Amazingly, miraculously, he found them open to the gospel. Why? Because they had what was called the tradition of the elders, a belief in an unchangeable, eternal, all-powerful God, the creator of the heaven and earth. Amazing. I share this with you this morning because we simply cannot appreciate Christianity among the Korean people who are among us today without observing something of the great price that was paid for them to come to be Christ followers. Today, as we recognize Brother and Mrs. Ye, I would offer the observation that when they and members of the Korean people arrived in the United States in 1997, we see the work of Adoniram Judson in reverse, almost if the work had come full circle. Judson and his wife Anne, at great personal sacrifice, left the United States to take the gospel to Burma. Two centuries later, the Yeas brought a small group of Korean believers to the United States where they have brought Korean people to the gospel. The Judsons took the gospel to the Koreans. The Yeas have brought the Koreans to the gospel. But if I may this morning, I would like to extend our tribute to these great evangelical visionaries to include the people of Gaston Oaks Baptist Church. 
when the Yays arrived at Gaston Oaks in, in 2005, they found a people who were receptive and welcoming of their Korean brothers and sisters. They found in the Gaston Oaks congregation a people who were grappling with their own sense of mortality, and yet, unwilling for the church to die, the Gaston Oaks situation was nothing new or unique. Churches all over the land are confronting the same fate. The difference, however, is that you all have chosen not to succumb to the tendency of us aging folks <laughs> to resist change. I've known personally of churches and indeed have served in several of them who made the decision that they would rather die than change. I want to commend you today because thinking outside the box is not a common attribute of people who grew up during the Great Depression with an inborn tenacity to hold on to what they had. And yet, look what thinking outside the box has produced in this place. At the point of every critical decision, you have chosen life rather than death. You've demonstrated that simply sharing the gospel is not enough, that the spirit in which you share it and the accompanying sacrifice, which is <coughs> empowers it, is critical. When we were preparing to begin a new work in Lampasas in 2003, I flew to California to observe the purpose-driven model of the church governance at Saddleback Church. I learned two key things that guided the beginning of our new work. Number one is this, unity is everything. Unity is everything. No effective work of the kingdom can be accomplished when we're distracted by strife and division in the fellowship. Secondly, we were guided by a statement of purpose that still guides that congregation, and it is this. A great commitment to the great commission and the great commandment makes a great church. Now we all know what the Great Commission is, go into all nations and preach the gospel. That's in the Great Commission as we know it in Matthew 28. But the actions of Gaston Oak Baptist Church in opening your doors and your hearts to the ever-changing culture around you also reminds us of the great commandment that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Gaston Christian Center stands today as a testimony to the truth that merely sharing the gospel is not enough. That the spirit in which we share it is vital. That the gospel shared mechanically by legalistic obedience falls on deaf ears. Adoniram and Ann Judson are paragons of this truth. Love that is not expressed in sacrifice is no love at all. Gaston Christian Center is a reality today because of a great church with a historic background in mission that has chose to do the sacrificial thing rather than the selfish thing. You found a way to perpetuate the sharing of the gospel by demonstrating your love, first through meeting human need in the example of Christ and facilitating quality of life, and through that, gaining the privilege of sharing the gospel. You know, the first time I walked through the halls of the Gaston Christian Center on a weekday afternoon and saw the classes that were jammed with Muslim women studying English as a second language, I was blown away. I would have never thought it possible, and it was not possible by conventional means of thinking. Listen, 
we will never reach the Muslim world or any other culture, including our own, by quoting passages from a Bible they don't consider authority. The demonstration of love is the only message they will hear. But that's what happened is just one of the ministries of Gateway of Grace, helping immigrants to assimilate into their new lifestyle. Healing Hand shows us that addressing physical illness is in the example of Jesus leads to the privilege of meeting spiritual needs as well. Kids University is tutoring children. Baki University is educating adults. All of these ministries and many more say to the people of the world that are coming to Dallas, Texas, we love you and we are willing to show you. No wonder ever-growing numbers of new converts are being baptized. If there's a sad note to all of this, it is that Gaston Christian Center's approach is the exception rather than the rule. Under the guidance of Drs. Bill O'Brien and Gary Cook, the Center has been doing what ought to be the normal way of going about reaching people for Christ. But you know, it's really hard for people who for so long have claimed ownership of their churches to come to the confession that what we have does not belong to us. It belongs to God, and we must use it, use it up for His great purposes. Surely that, more than anything else, has been the catalyst for all that has happened here. Thank you. People of Gaston Oaks and Brother and Miss Gate for your vision of what could be. We celebrate the realization of God's plans for Gaston Christian Center. Presently realized and the vision of what can be in the future as we move out of the leadership of this man. Let me pray. Father God, we are so thankful today for all that we have observed that is going on. Thank you for a warm time of worship with these wonderful Korean Christians this morning. What a blessing it has been. As we give notice to, from whence we have come to what can be in the future days, we pray that your spirit would continue to guide us. As Dr. O'Brien moves on into retirement, we pray for your leadership especially in bringing us the person who will be the director of the center. We give you praise, Lord, that even in the midst of a very secular and humanistic culture, we find this wonderful oasis of people from nine different congregations who are worshiping you in this place. We give you thanks for these great blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.